Hello. Sorry, it feels like I'm on a burp. There you go. Hello, everybody. Uh, these zero people watching right now, but I'm sure that'll pick up. People will be watching at some point. Uh, I am back. The pain was good enough today that I could make it down the stairs to my computer to do the video, which is always a nice bonus. So <clears throat> let us talk about uh, the nine-game slate, and then uh, if we have time, talk about some basketball. Anything else you want to talk about? I will say I, uh, I came up with two lineups for the U.S. Open. I had a balanced one, and I had a Stars and Scrubs one. I went with the Stars and Scrubs one. And, of course, uh, you know, my Ricky Fowler lineup that has uh, sh the, the top <laughs> top three guys right now <clears throat> was the balanced one. So, yeah, what are you going to do? That's why I try to play more than one lineup, but I just, yeah, you know, with golf, it's so tricky. Anyway, how's everybody doing tonight? Let's do this. Let's get rolling. Uh, game number uh, number one. We got the D-backs at the Nats. Uh, we got Granky at Eric Fetty. Uh, this is one where uh, really like Granky, really like Arizona bats. That's pretty simple. Uh, Granky is a good pitcher. Uh, he has proven himself to be worth you know 10k or so uh, a start. Uh, you know, the more strikeouts the team he's going against gets, the better for him and the more likelihood that he will, uh, you know, go over value for what he is, uh, what he costs. And 9,300 for him against a Nats team that strikes out a ton uh, looks really, really good. On top of that, one of their hottest, uh, one of their best batters, I should say, Juan Soto, is cold lately. Uh, and they're also playing Kurt Suzuki for Jan Gomes, which is a downgrade offensively. And they're playing Gerardo Parra, who has been one of the coldest uh, players offensively in baseball the last couple of weeks uh, or so. So all of those things are a boost for Granky. I know Turner, Eaton, and Rendon are always going to be tough. Uh, I know Dozier finally heat, uh, hotted up over the last uh, little bit of time. But this is a lineup I think that Granky should be able to work around without too much of a problem. Uh, and I would definitely have him uh, in the pool of... Uh, pitchers that I would like to target today. Uh, on the other side, Eric Fetty has been pitching okay over the last couple weeks, but as I've said before, uh, he's not a very good pitcher. Uh, this is a underrated Diamondbacks team. Uh, they might not have the highest projected run total of the day, but I don't think anyone would be surprised if, uh, if I told you tomorrow, hey, the Diamondbacks put up 10 runs against Eric Fetty. You'd be like, yeah, so what? It's the Diamondbacks and Eric Fetty. Uh, the Diamondbacks do not have a single batter that's cold. Uh, and we have batters that were priced over 5,000 that have sunk below. So uh, while, you know, Escobar has been red hot and is 5,500, so he's going to cost you, uh, you have Kettle Marte, who is going to be batting second, who's better as a right-handed batter, but he has still been hot from both sides of the plate over the last week. Uh, and his price, which was in the mid 5,000s, has come down to 4,900. Uh, Christian Walker, I, I, while I'm not, I don't, I don't believe in the do for a homer thing, uh, he does hit enough homers. And Eric Fetty does give up enough homers uh, that I would be okay with that. The one thing I would caution, hey, Eduardo, everything's okay enough. You know, I get by. Uh, the one thing I would caution about Fetty is he is a uh, extreme sinker ball type pitcher. So uh, he does not leave the ball up enough for home runs while, uh, you know, and I was going to go into this with Ivan Nova later, but I can go into it now instead. Um, when you have a sinker baller, uh, if they're pitching well, excuse me, if their command is good, even if they're not pitching well, uh, you're still not going to be able to put up those kind of stack numbers that you would against most other types of pitchers because uh, a sinker pitcher is still going to keep the ball on the ground for the most part. And Eric Fetty throws a sinker 55% of the time. So while I do like the Diamondbacks, while I do think they are a good stack, uh, I do think that if you are going to spend 5000 per, uh, there are going to be better options today just looking at everything. Uh, there are some really cheap dudes here. Again, you know, Christian Walker, 2,900. Nick Ahmed, 2,700 on, on FanDuel is just too cheap. Uh, Peralta shouldn't be 4,400 or 3,800 uh, on either of those sites. So 
you are going to get some good bats here. I would just be cautious. Uh, you know, there are going to be other spots that are, are better off in terms of pitchers and in terms of everything else. Uh, one of them is coming up right now, uh, and that is the Blue Jays and the O's. Uh, I've said many, many times the, the Blue Jays have made the worst pitchers in the league look like aces this year, and they continue to do it, but they still have some home run power. Uh, Inoa, pitching for the Orioles, is a terrible pitcher uh, who gets lit up and allows a ton of home runs. The Blue Jays are not priced like a team that is going against the Orioles. And because of that, I am definitely a big fan of loading up on them. Um, Sogard is leading off at 5,100 on DraftKings, I think is going to be a little too much. Uh, but the 3,200 on FanDuel is absolutely fantastic. Uh, Vladdy is underpriced for his talent on both sides. Goriel is the hottest hitter on the Blue Jays and has been for about two and a half weeks now. Uh, he's only 4,300 on DraftKings and only 2,900 on FanDuel. That is fantastic, and I would be well overweight on him and a Blue Jays stack for what it's worth. Smoke, on the other hand, as I've talked about with him several times, is a very streaky hitter. Um, you can take the chance that today's the day he gets hot or you know, worry that today's the day he gets cold, but generally when he is riding a hot streak, I like to, to, to go above the field on him, and when he is cold, I like to go under the field on him, and he has been cold as anything the last week. For that reason, and additionally because he is a much hotter and will save you a lot of money, uh, I would rather take Rowdy Tellez at first base if you're going with the Blue Jays stack. Uh, he's fifth in the order instead of fourth, but he'll save you $900 on DraftKings and $1,000 on FanDuel. He had a grand slam yesterday. Uh, the dude is a lefty who mashes righties, extreme normal splits, but he has great, great power numbers, uh, especially against righties that already give up home runs. So this is a fantastic spot for Rowdy Tellez as it is. I would be, again, well over the field on him. Uh, and while I'm not a big fan of uh, Tiascar Hernandez, Biggio, Galvis, or Jansen, uh, it, there is enough here that I would at least take a Blue Jays mini stack. The Orioles not only have a terrible starting pitcher, but their bullpen is just as bad, and they give up more home runs than just about anybody in baseball. So Blue Jays, one of the best stacks today. Uh, they've let enough people down consistently enough this year that their ownership is going to be under what it should be uh, any given day. So you really don't have to worry about that as much as you would for other teams. So yeah, Blue Jays looking good. On the other side, we have Stroman. Uh, Stroman is much like uh, an Eric Fetty, uh, a, a much better, obviously, version of him. But he is a, a pitcher that throws sinkers and keeps the ball on the ground. So while he hasn't been pitching well, uh, the metrics around him not pitching well aren't, you know, blow up, let's stack against him. They're just, we can't really play him type of, of metrics. So uh, Stroman is not someone I'm going to play. The Orioles do have enough pop. They're going to score over four runs, according to Vegas. Uh, they have enough decent bats, especially with Mancini, a reverse splits righty, hot as anything. Cisco, a lefty uh, hitting catcher with extreme normal splits that has been uh, the hottest hitter on the Orioles over the last week. Santander has made a, a noticeable difference uh, since they moved him to the number two hole. He's a switch hitter that hits significantly better as a lefty, so this matches up uh, better for him as well. So while I'm not saying I recommend an O stack, uh, much like uh, with the Diamondbacks, it's tough to do that when you're going against an extreme sinker ball type guy. Uh, the Orioles are not someone that we can't consider. Uh, so as I, as I like to point out for those of you that play 150, uh, if you are playing 150, I would definitely have a couple lineups uh, of the Orioles out there. My wife got me a root beer two nights ago. I'm very, very grateful. It's my favorite drink, and I so rarely, rarely have it. Uh, let's see, any other lineups come out since I started talking? Nope. So we're at Angels Rays. Both of these are official, and I have all the work on them. Anyway, uh, we have uh, uh, Tyler Skaggs for the Angels and Ryan Yarbrough for the Rays. Both of these are very, very interesting, um, but for opposite reasons. So let's start with Yarbrough, because I've talked about him the same way I've talked about Chirinos. 
Uh, Yarbrough is a very talented pitcher who is underpriced and underowned because he has been relegated to long relief, basically. Uh, Yarbrough is someone who, if you look back over the last uh, couple of years of game logs, <clears throat> He has come in after an opener, uh, you know, all but two or three starts. So the price on him is one uh, that is lower than it should be because you have to factor in the limited innings, uh, the fact that he cannot get bonuses like a complete game or a shutout uh, and everything else. So Yarbrough is priced down as if he were... Uh, coming in after an opener. But as far as I have seen, and maybe this has changed very, very recently, uh, he is not. As far as I have seen, and I will double check again, because we know this changes all the time, especially with Tampa Bay. Uh, as far as I have seen, Yarbrough is the straight up starter. And that is still indeed what is happening. Okay, so Yarbrough is the straight up starter. That means that he, again, is going to go underpriced and underowned because people know him as the long reliever uh, and they don't want to take that kind of chance. On top of that, you know, people don't want to take lefties against uh, an Angels team because of Mike Trout. But I think you're doing yourself a disservice uh, looking at up and down the, the Angels lineup. I think that lefties are better. Uh, than righties against them, or they would line up better against them. You know, Fletcher is cold. Uh, Otani cannot hit lefties, uh, and he's batting third today. Puello's been good. Calhoun's been good, but Calhoun doesn't hit lefties very well. You know, Listella batting eighth uh, doesn't hit lefties very well. Uh, all, well, that's not true. Listella hits lefties better than he hits righties, but he hits certain lefties and certain pitch types better. And Yarbrough doesn't line up as well. So uh, while I do think, you know, Lestella would be a sneakier one-off given his uh, reverse splits and his predilection to hitting curveballs, I think that Yarbrough uh, and the Rays, again, know how to pitch around people. So they have all the information I have and work before games start to develop, you know, most pitchers do, but specific plans for what batters are weak against what pitches and then what to throw them and when. So Lestella, while, you know, if this were a different team, I would be higher up on him. Against the Rays, I just always favor uh, a craftier Rays pitcher over uh, an Angels offense that has shown uh, the ability to underperform uh, while not striking out so much. Uh, and then when Ren Gifo uh, batting last is cold and doesn't hit very well. So all in all, you know, you have Mike Trout, who you have to worry about. You have Pujols, who has his games where he looks like he's 26 again every once in a while. Uh, you have Puello, who looks good. Smith is a good hitter, especially against lefties. But Yarbrough is under 7,000, and I would expect him to be able to get 15 to 20 points. Uh, Tampa Bay is predicted to win this game 4.8 to 4.1, according to Vegas. <clears throat> so he would even get the bonus of having a win. LA is only projected to get 4.1 runs. So again, while I'm not saying that uh, this is an LA lineup that is, is worth you know, staying away from all the time, I'm not saying that, you know, this is an LA lineup that has nobody in it. I am saying that Yarbrough is uh, undervalued for his skill set. And that is confirmed. I just went on to Roto Grinders while I was talking. Yarbrough is projected for 1% ownership and projected to get more than two times value. And he has a ceiling for much more because when Roto Grinders does this stuff, when Roto Grinders does their projections, they don't factor in uh, like wins as much as they should. And you know, I, I will, I will, yeah, let's take a look here because I have my projections free for one last day. Today is going to be the last one. So bathrobesports.com. There, I'm going to type it out so y'all can go because I don't like saying the word hyphen when I'm doing clickety clack. That is free today. So please, please take a look, see what you like. Uh, I am going to go to the projections right now and let you know what I have for Yarbrough because I want to know what I have for Yarbrough and I don't remember. Oh, I have to fix the catcher stuff too. Shit. 
For Yarbrough, I have him getting 14.09 points for 2.07 value. So I have him doing a slightly worse than, than Roto Grinders, but in the same neighborhood. And regardless, 6,800 is just too cheap. You know, Tyler Skaggs is projected to get uh, 0 0.01 more points than Yarbrough today, according to me. And that is, you know, a $1,400 price difference. So I think that, again, Yarbrough is not the safest pitcher. He's not, uh, you know, he, he doesn't have the skill set of a Chirinos. You know, he's not someone that I think is going to be, uh, you know, crushing the 10K mark. Uh, in a couple of weeks if he is allowed to maintain a normal starting role. But he is someone who will be between 8,500 and 9,000 in a couple of weeks. And getting him for 6,800, even against a, a rough and tumble A's, uh, Angels offense, is good enough for me. So if you're trying to get in some of those expensive bats today, uh, with 1% ownership, with his ceiling, with the, the idea that he could get a win, which would give him an extra four points, that he has decent strikeout stuff, that enough of these angels are bad enough. <coughs> Excuse me. I think Yarbrough is going to be a really sneaky way uh, to get some other people in the lineup that no one is going to have. Anytime you have a chance to get one of these talented, long relief guys for Tampa Bay that they move into an actual starter spot, you should try to make sure that you are all over it. Because again, that, that is, they do the long relief because it's smart, not because these pitchers aren't good. And I've talked about this before, right? The best hitters. Uh, okay. I'm going to backtrack a second because it's important. A lot of people ask why do, why are all these, baseball teams starting to do openers and it's a, it's it's a question that is it's it's important to know the answer to right so as saber metrics has increased its usage in in front offices as they've started to understand you know the importance of everything including like batting order that they ignored uh, for for decades uh, everything has changed in baseball it used to be you know, the number one hitter was the speed guy. The number two hitter was a contact guy that was good at bunting. The number three hitter was your best hitter. Your number four hitter was your best power hitter. And your number five hitter was your second best hitter or your best RBI guy, depending on how you wanted to work it. But that was the general template that pretty much every team followed. And then a few years ago, they realized, hey, the guy who leads off gets you know, 30, 40 more at bats a season, it would make more sense and generate more runs if we put our best hitter first. And then the second hitter gets 25 more at bats a season. So it would be better if we put, you know, the second best hitter second. So what we had in baseball is a move from uh, the best hitters being the three, four, five to the best hitters being the one, two, three. And what that leads you to, to, to be able to do is put a bullpen arm that will get you through the one, two, three hitter as if it was a closer. And then when you go to your starter, that starter starts at the four or five hitter, which means he gets to go through five, six batters before he gets to what is now the meat of the lineup, the one, two, three. So they get to get warm. They get to get their feet under them. And then better yet, instead of facing them three or four times, now they only have to face them one, two, or three times, depending on how long they're going to go in the game and how successful they are. So while annoying for us, it makes perfect baseball sense if you understand the reasoning behind why they do it. And as we see, you know, Mike Trout, who used to be a three, four, or five hitter, is now a two hitter. Uh, we see Jock, Jock Peterson for L.A., who would have been a five hitter, uh, you know, 10 years ago is leading off against righties. It's, it's a complete change in the way baseball teams construct their lineups. So why not take the advantage of being able to put a, your, your best one inning pitcher against those dudes at the beginning to clear an easier path for your starter, right? So that's the reason they do that. It makes sense, but that doesn't mean that these dudes are bad pitchers, right? It doesn't mean that Chirinos is a bad pitcher. It doesn't mean that Yarbrough or Jalen Beeks 
are bad pitchers. It just means it's smarter for them to do it this way. You know, if you're an absolute ace, if you're a Snell, if you're a Charlie Morton, they don't have to do that as much. But for uh, for other pitchers who are not aces, even the good ones, not aces, but good ones, it's smarter to do it this way against a lot of teams. Now, the Rays have been showing faith in Chirinos and Yarbrough lately by letting them get some starts. And Yarbrough, again, is underpriced for his skill set, for his projections, and the 1% ownership is just, just too, too nice. Uh, I'm sorry to belabor it, but I think it's important to go into all of this stuff because understanding the why will help you to, to reason better next time you see an opener. You know, you might think about things a little differently. Uh, on the other side, we have, <coughs> excuse me, Tyler Skaggs, who has not looked good lately. Uh, if you look through his stats here, uh, the 9.8 strikeouts per nine is fantastic, but that's about as good as it gets for him. The 4.1 walks per nine, uh, 1.7 home runs per nine, 1.45 whip, and that's with, you know, getting decently lucky. Uh, 7.36 ERA, 4.69 FIP. None of those are fantastic. And this is a raised team, again, projected to get about five runs that knows how to construct a lineup against left-handed pitching. Uh, so you have uh, Garcia, Pham, who have been hitting well lately. I wouldn't classify them as hot, but they've been hitting well lately, and they both mash lefties. Brandon Lau, who's hitting for, uh, who's taking the lineup spot of Austin Meadows, who's actually been cold for the first time this year. Lau, one of the hottest hitters on the team. Uh, not as good against lefties, but... You know, Skaggs is going to pitch the whole game. Yandy Diaz, who's been great against lefties this year, even though he shows reverse splits, batting cleanup. Darno, <coughs> excuse me, who has been statistically the hottest hitter on Tampa Bay, as hard as, a, uh, as it is for me to believe that as a Mets fan. Uh, he gets to bat cleanup, or excuse me, he gets to bat fifth, uh, and they're using him either as a DH or catcher, I'm assuming as the DH, but that just shows you how good he has been lately and how good his upside is against lefties. Uh, Adames has been great against lefties. Kiermaier, while not good against lefties, has been the third hottest hitter on Tampa Bay over the last week. Uh, this is a very, very well-constructed Rays lineup. Again, I hate to belabor the point because I'm not a Rays fan by any stretch, but I understand why their front office and why their manager makes the moves that they make. And it's because they they understand matchups, they understand splits, they understand not just what the advanced metrics are, but what they mean and how to use them. That's why I don't like taking batters when Tampa Bay does the opener thing, because I know how they manage their pitching staff and it's to minimize damage. There's a reason that uh, opponents going against Tampa Bay have a lower run total than their average for the year. And it's not uh, simply because Tampa Bay has good pitching. It's because they know what they're doing. And that applies to the pitching and the hitting. Favorite low-owned stack for single-entry GPPs, asks Mike Fong. Okay, so I haven't gone through everything here. Ooh, the Cardinals stack just popped. So let me uh, let me look at that real quick for you, because as of right now, I I'm leaning on the Rays. I really really do like them a lot, um, because the Padres and the Rockies are not going to be underowned at all. <sighs> okay, so I have a I have a couple that I think are going to be. Uh, underrepresented today. Um, the first is the Rays. <clears throat> Excuse me. I don't think the Rays are going to be owned uh, enough for, for what Tyler Skaggs is and what he does and how low his floor can be. Uh, I also don't think that they will be owned for the projection of runs that they have, uh, and I don't think their price is, is good enough that you have to worry. Uh, uh, you know, Brandon Lau, who again has a bad lefty on lefty matchup, is the most expensive player on Tampa Bay at 4,600, at 46,000, 4,600. I was right the first time. Ugh, medicine. 
Garcia is leading off 44, Pham 41, Diaz 4,000, Darno a steal the way he's been hitting, 3,300, a Dames batting 6, 3,500, Daniel Robertson, who can only hit lefties, 2,600. I wouldn't trust him to play the whole game, but these are a lot of dudes that are going to get some, some serious at-bats. The other one here, <coughs> excuse me, I'm going to get to in a second. Uh, Mike Fong, because it's in the next game that I'm going to talk about. And I think that given the hat I'm wearing, it's going to surprise a lot of people. Um, the next game is the Cardinals and the Mets. Cardinals lineup has popped. Uh, there is no Dexter Fowler today. It's Carpenter, DeYoung, Goldschmidt, Ozuna, Martinez, Molina, Wong, and then Bader. So we have uh, a cold Jose Martinez coming in for a moderately hitting uh, Dexter Fowler. And Fowler would have the matchup advantage against him. So that is a, a slight boost to DeGrom. But that being said, there is something that I want to talk about today. And this is going to tie into your question, Mike. Um, who do I think the sneakiest unowned stack is today? The Cardinals. And I'm going to tell you why. And this is going to be one of those inside baseball things. Pitchers like certain catchers, right? I don't, I don't think that should be a surprise to you, but if you don't follow baseball that closely, you may not know that, you know, the, a pitcher and a catcher has a very familial relationship. They love each other. They look out for each other. They are like another team within a team. And there are certain pitchers and catchers that have different visions and that just don't work well together. Uh, when you have that happen, what you see is a pitcher underperforming consistently, right? And we've seen this many times throughout the years. I could note examples uh, it, it you know happened to Kershaw. It it happens a lot. What we've had happen this year is, <clears throat> excuse me, Jacob Degrom does not like pitching to Wilson Ramos. Jacob Degrom has asked uh, Mickey Callaway and the Mets staff that Thomas Nito or Tomas Nito, I should say, uh, is essentially that would essentially be his his personal catcher. And we see that from time to time as well, where a team will keep around an extra catcher, a third catcher, simply because a specific pitcher wants to pitch to that guy. That uh, happens on the Cubs uh, the last couple of years. Jacob deGrom only wants to pitch to Tomas Nito. He does not like pitching to Wilson Ramos. He pitches worse when he pitches to Wilson Ramos. All the statistics are there. All that is on the public record. A couple of weeks ago, uh, Mickey Calloway gave a press conference talking about how uh, Jacob deGrom has asked that he only pitch to Tomas Nito, but how that's not necessarily in the Mets' best interest because Wilson Ramos is a much better bat. They want to get that bat in the lineup, and deGrom is just going to have to learn how to pitch with him because that's how it works. Uh, you know, while I can understand that kind of tough love bullshit. Uh, Jacob deGrom won a Cy Young Award last year and has looked really badly uh, when Wilson Ramos has has caught him. Now, lately, they have uh, acceded to his, his demands, and Nito has caught him his last few times starting. Uh, but today, I projected Nito to start, but it looks like Wilson Ramos is getting the start for the Mets instead. Now, while I don't think that DeGrom is going to, you know, throw the game, I don't think that, oh, absolutely, Eduardo, all of that stuff matters. I try to look at everything. I had a sheet at the beginning of the year when the Arizona Diamondbacks were playing with the three catchers. They had John Ryan Murphy, Kelly, and another dude. I can't even remember. I'll look at it in a second. And it seemed like they were different every day. So I wanted to put together like how pitchers were pitching to which catchers, all of that stuff matters. That stuff that a lot of people don't talk about because if you don't really like watch baseball, you may not understand how deep some of this shit gets. Right. And all of that is stuff that I want to, I want to put on the table and you can decide if you like it, if it's worthwhile for you or if it isn't. 
personally, I think that I have seen enough that if a if a pitcher is comfortable with a catcher, you let that pitcher pitch to the catcher. And if a pitcher flat out publicly says, I don't like that dude as much as that dude, and you're like, eh, here's that guy anyway, he's not going to pitch as well. Maybe he is. I mean, granted, it's baseball. DeGrom could go out tonight and throw a no-hitter. But what I would say is that on average, with Wilson Ramos catching him, DeGrom is going to do worse than projected and worse than everybody thinks. That's a big deal when DeGrom is the second most popular pitcher tonight. I would much rather take that extra chance on an unowned, underpriced Cardinals offense that, let's face it, has a good history of mashing the shit out of this Mets team over DeGrom today. I, I do like Flaherty a lot, and I will get to that as well especially for the price, but the ownership should worry you, Mike, and I'm going to get to that as well. Otherwise, if Flaherty was even in the middle of the pack in ownership, I would be a, a huge fan given everything in this game. Uh, but I'll, I'll, let me get to that in a second because I really do think it's important. DeGrom, you know, I I, I don't want to, 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 to give a million different takes because that's not what I, I'm trying to do here. My take is clear. I would rather play St. Louis bats than DeGrom today. Okay. Anytime I see DeGrom pitching to Wilson Ramos, if he is going against a functional offense, I am going to favor that functional offense because it's not that DeGrom is a bad pitcher. It's because DeGrom is going to take ownership that he doesn't deserve and the conditions, all of the conditions of his start are not going to be adequately accounted for. And again, we can see that today. DeGrom is the second most popular pitcher on DraftKings, but does he really deserve to be when his numbers are, you know, twice as bad with Ramos behind the plate as with Nito behind the plate? And I think that, you know, again, that's very important to consider. The Yankees lineup has come out. I haven't gotten to them yet, so that's fine. Um, so, Mike Fong, to answer your, your, your question, I think Tampa Bay is going to be my favorite safer unknown stack. But in terms of the best way to get against the field, uh, the best team that could go off today that no one is really talking about, it is the Cardinals. They have a history. They hit the Mets well. Uh, they have no problem hitting in city field. And... Jacob deGrom with Wilson Ramos is a cause for concern, whether or not anyone wants to, to talk about that elephant in the room. Uh, I suggest you go back and take a look at, uh, at what they were talking about a couple of weeks to just verify, not just verify, but you can see, like, I'm, I'm not exaggerating it either. I'm not, you know, trying to make a mountain out of a molehill. This is a legitimate concern that deGrom has, uh, and they are trying to ignore it today. So while he's projected to get, you know, a sizable win with a, you know, almost, you know a 0.6 run win, I'd rather have the Cardinals today. I think they're going to do better than Vegas. I think they're going to do better than their prices. Uh, and, you know, apart from Ozuna, who's 4,600, everybody is 3,800 and under. So you can get some of the more expensive pitchers uh, that you wouldn't have been able to get. Oh yeah, no problem, Mike Fong. I actually, let me, I'm going to get to that in a few minutes too. The next game has my favorite sneaky pitcher of the day, uh, and that's Texas Boston. Well, two my two favorite sneaky pitchers of the day, actually. I'll get to that in a second. But I do want to talk about Flaherty. Flaherty is someone that I would have liked a lot today. Uh, going in uh, to to today when I build my lineups last night, my my well, the first pitcher that I locked in at 7,300 on DraftKings was Flaherty, right? I don't think that you can look at his skill level or anything else, uh, look at the the amount of times the Mets strike out and see a, a terrible choice, right? He may not be the ace tonight. He may not give you the highest score, but it's hard to look at that and say like, oh, I got to stay away, right? As a lot of cheap pitchers, you may have that visceral and correct uh, reaction to but there's a lot there's a lot here that we need to look at and again I, I hate to to delve too far into things if you're looking for quick answers Flaherty is projected to get 52 
percent ownership in GPPs on DraftKings, not cash. 52%. Okay. Now, this is a pitcher who in the last couple of weeks, 8.3 strikeouts per nine, not bad for, for his price. 3.1 walks per nine, 3.1 home runs per nine, a 1.38 whip, which is not terrible, 6.84 FIP. Flaherty is not a stone cold lock, right? If he were 10, 14% owned, he would be someone I would love to take a chance on tonight. The Mets have a low enough total, et cetera, et cetera. City Field is a boost to pitchers. There's a lot there to like, but there's also a lot there not to like, right? Uh, I don't have projected ownership on FanDuel, and I do apologize for that. The only thing I have on Roto Grinders is, uh, is, um, oh, you know what? Hold on a second here. Hold on a second here. Let me check because I think I let me let me let me let me let me Awesome mode. They do three projections on Thursdays, which lines up really well with yes, they do. Hooray. Okay. So let's sort that out. I want pitchers. So as of right now on FanDuel, uh DeGrom 34%, Flaherty 17%. Those are the only two pitchers over 9%. So those two would be overwhelming chalk. Uh, according to Osimo, who's, again, who their ownership projections are significantly better uh, than Roto-Grinders. Anyone who tells you otherwise works for Roto-Grinders. <laughs> That's flat out. I do not get money from anybody <laughs> except you guys and all that stuff. So I have no, like, there's no, there's no horse in this race for me. I don't, I don't care who wins and who loses between these two, Roto-Grinders and Osimo. I can tell you, though, when it comes to numbers, Osimo kicks Roto-Grinders to the curb. It's not, it's it's a joke, a joke. So talking about that, uh, Osimo has Jacob deGrom at 44% ownership and Flaherty at 42% ownership. So while not 52%, that's still... Uh, it, Extremely, my sound is bad. Can you try reloading? Does anyone else having that problem? Please tell me if anyone else is having that problem, and I will restart or do whatever because I'm 38 minutes in and I haven't changed anything. Okay, maybe try restarting serve five. I'm sorry, I have I've been doing this 38, and this is the first I've heard of it, so ew. I'm sorry. I don't maybe if I do a mute, okay. I'll, I won't touch anything, then. but let me, let me continue. So with, with Flaherty getting anywhere from 42 to 52% ownership, there's absolutely no way I'm going to be on him in a GPP. There's just too much floor for there, for me. Uh, you know, if he were middle of the pack against the Mets, fine. But even that is, is tough. If you look at the Mets lineup over the last week, not a single bat for them is cold. Not a single one. McNeil has been hitting well. Conforto has been hitting well. Alonzo is about to break the Mets record. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Sir, five, try reloading. Like, do a reload, like a, a browser reload on the YouTube thing, and then join us again in a second. And if that doesn't work, I don't know what it is because I haven't done anything differently. And I don't know anything about computers to fix it. So I'm just, you know, just kind of like push things like a monkey trying to take Shakespeare. Uh, anyway, Alonzo has been hitting well, home run masher, Dom Smith, Frazier, Ramos, and Carlos Gomez, who are all in the lineup. Oh, excellent. Thank you, sir. Five. I'm glad. I'm glad. Uh, Smith, Frazier, Ramos, and Gomez, who are all in the lineup have all been hot over the last, over the last week. So again, uh, I'm going to go over this specifically with you because when Flaherty is getting that much interest, it pays to know, uh, if it is, as good a play as, 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 as the masses have led you to believe. And while it looks like it, you know, on the surface, the more you dig in, the, the more problematic it gets. So Carlos Gomez over the last week, 1.455 OPS with a 545 ISO and a 595 WOBA. 
Todd Frazier, 1.090 OPS, 350 ISO, 451 WOBA. Dom Smith, 1.042 OPS, 333 ISO, 428 WOBA. Conforto, three, uh, excuse me, 923, down dyslexia, 923 OPS, 182 ISO, 396 WOBA. McNeil, 900 OPS, 200 ISO, 377 WOBA. I am pretty far into this Mets lineup already, and that's a lot of hot dudes. There is seriously not a single batter in this lineup with an OPS that's anything uh, concerning. Uh, in terms of cheap catchers, give me one second here. And I will, oh yeah, give me one second here. Let me do a quick check as to the pricing right now. <clears throat> So it depends on what you mean by cheap, right? Uh, if we're looking at, uh, you know, bottom basement pricing, there's only two catchers that I have, like, in the 2000s, and that is Maldonado and Mathis, and those are just straight-up punts. You never really have to think about the matchup with them. You're price-playing them, Uh Either, either time. And specifically tonight with Mathis taking on price, you're double price playing him. Oh, professional writing. Um, Maldonado has a, a worse, oh, Maldonado has another bad matchup against Boyd. I don't like either of them. If you're willing to go into the low threes, which is where I would, I would spend today. I think a lot of people are going to try to spend the 2000 or the 2100 on catcher because they want DeGrom and they want other expensive bats. I think that's going to leave those like uh, the middle priced catchers completely underrepresented. So I really love Darno at 3300. I really love Yadi Molina at 3400. I really like Chance Cisco at 3500. Um, let me see if there's anybody else in the mid price range. Oh, you know what? If this is correct, Austin Hedges. I missed that. Austin Hedges in Coors Field, 2,900. That's as good a cheap punt as you are going to get at catcher. I apologize for missing that before. Uh, Austin Hedges, if he winds up being in the lineup, Austin Hedges, 2,900 in Coors Field. That is a fantastic, fantastic boost. But yeah, that's where I would sit. That's who I like today. Uh, if I'm going... Uh, if I'm not using the catcher as part of the stack, uh, yeah, I like I like those. All right, well, Mike, let's keep let's keep talking. You can find these dudes because I really like, I really like. Uh, I think Tampa Bay would be a decent choice for that uh, with Darno, Diaz, and uh, and then you could get like Garcia in there. Honestly, like that's that's really fantastic. Uh, Carpenter is 3,800. Yadi Molina is 3,400. And then you can get Ozuna in there, probably. That's going to be close. Minus one, minus five. That's 600. And then for 45, now you'd be off by 100. Uh, but that's, I mean, you're getting, you're getting real close. There's a few, there's a few stacks there. Uh, catcher third base outfield for 3,900 each. You should be able more than, more than able to fill that in. Uh, with a bunch of these dudes. Um, you know, Todd Frazier, 4,100 is underpriced. Ramos, 4,100 is underpriced. But again, if Hedges is playing for 2,900 in Coors Field, as much as I like Darno, as much as I like Molina, as much as I like Cisco, uh, that pricing is just far too low. You have to pay for the environment there. You have to pay for the five-point whatever run total San Diego's going to get. You have to pay for the fact that they're probably going to pitch around him to get to the pitcher, which is extra points, even if he's not getting you a home run. Taking, you know, six, eight points on walks and runs is good enough for me, um, especially, especially sub 3000. So I hope that answers that question. So Flaherty, I'm going to summarize Flaherty. I, I do like today. I don't want to say I don't like him because I do think he is a decent pitcher in a decent spot against the Mets. But given his recent form, given the fact that he's going to be 42 to 52% owned, given the fact that not, not one Mets hitter in this lineup has been cold lately, and majority of them have been classified as hot, if you go by the way I rank them. Uh, this is just, it's too worrying a spot. Uh, while, again, it's not one of my favorite stacks, I often like to point out that 
the best way to leverage against the field in a GPP is not just to avoid chalky pitchers, but to actively stack against them. Uh, it creates extra leverage, obviously, because you're not just taking the batters, you're taking unowned bats because people who play Flaherty aren't going to play a Mets stack, right? So you get a lot of unowned, decent Mets bats that nobody else is going to be on because everyone thinks Flaherty's in a good spot. And he is. Again, I'm not saying he's not. I'm just saying that the ownership for Flaherty and the ownership for the Mets bats is not... Uh, is not uh, how do, how do I word this? They're not right, right? You know, they're not adequate. They're not accurate for for the potential, for the ceiling, for everything else. So while I'm not loading up on men's bats tonight, uh, if I'm playing multiple lineups, I sure as hell I'm going to have a few Mets bats in there. I would have more exposure to Mets bats than I would to Flaherty tonight because again of the ownership projections for Flaherty and how much of a risk uh, I think there is. So in summary, a lot of people, and I Matt, I haven't really checked, no problem. Hey, that's what I'm here for, Mike Fong. That's why I do this Q&A because it's not just me talking. I want to be here to help however I can. And if it's, you know, bouncing ideas off of or working you, helping you work through the lineup that you're building, I love doing that. It is my absolute pleasure to go into anything that I can to help you guys. And that's what I'm always going to be here to do. So in summary with this game, if you want to go chalk, Flaherty and DeGrom, they're the two highest owned pitchers. They're going to be the two highest owned pitchers on DraftKings and on FanDuel. I would rather take the bats given again, DeGrom having Ramos as the catcher and everything else and Flaherty being in poor form and the Mets being good hitters and everything else. So let's move on. We got Texas, Boston, Texas, Boston gives you my favorite pitcher of the day. And that is David price at 9,700. Uh, I'm not the biggest David price fan, uh, but I will tell you that Texas strikes out a lot and Texas does not hit left handers very well. Uh, the Texas Rangers are, I would say the worst team in baseball against left-handed pitching especially left-handed pitching that can get some strikeouts. And that's what we're looking at with David Price. Uh, there's a reason the Rangers have a 3.2 run total today, and it's because they are not good against lefties. And this just looks really, really bad uh, for them. The weather is great. It's going to be cool in the mid to low 50s with the wind blowing in, not 10, but close enough to 10, that it's a slight boost to pitching, uh, all weather things considering. But... David Price, a lefty going against a Texas Rangers offense that does not hit lefties, looks fantastic. Chu, leading off, doesn't hit lefties very well. Bonus already. DeShields batting second is a joke. He's barely a hitter when he's hitting ninth, much less second. Andrus, legitimately good hitter. That would be concern. Hunter Pence, hot and a good hitter. That would be a cause for concern. But then you have Azdrubal Cabrera, who hasn't been doing well. Danny Santana, who only hits well as a lefty, which means he's in a bad spot today as a switch hitter. Logan Forsyth, who's been really cold. Ronet Odor, who's a lefty that doesn't hit lefties. And Jeff Mathis, who might be the worst hitter in baseball. Uh, that is a very nice lineup for David Price to go through. And I'm going to be well over the field if I were playing multiple lineups. David Price is the third highest projected pitcher today at 20% owned. And again, that's 52% for Flaherty, 36% for DeGrom. If you go to uh, to Osimo, 21% for Price. That is half of Flaherty and less than half of DeGrom. And there is no foreseeable way that you can argue that if given these matchups, DeGrom is going to outscore, uh, outscore David Price more than twice uh, the, the, the time. So... You know, give me David Price today. Texas, very bad against the lefties. David Price looks very good. On the other side, this is my sneaky pitcher. Uh, I love the way Adrian Sampson has been pitching. I mean, absolutely love. I, I don't know if he's completely flying under the radar. Uh, the ownership of 1% would say that he has. And I think that that is uh, a huge, 
huge oversight. People are, again, looking at the fact that he was um, going in after an opener, given the fact mm -hmm. that he doesn't have the best pedigree, and they're ignoring the fact that he's been fucking crushing it. So let's go back to May 17th, uh, when he was still coming in as uh, as a long reliever and not getting starts yet. That started uh, a couple of weeks ago. 11.2 DKP, 21.6 DKP. Okay, that's two wins in a row. Next, next one, got uh, again out of the bullpen, 15.9 DKP and a win. Then they gave him the starts. Since he's been starting, he's going Chirinos on people. He was 6,900, okay? Went seven innings, 11 strikeouts, 35 DKP, and a win. His price the next start went down $500 against Oakland. He responded by throwing a complete game, four hits, one run, one walk, seven strikeouts, 35.8 DKP. His price only went up 700. So we have someone who has now gotten two starts against a poor and a good offense, has gotten 35 plus DKP both times, has looked good both times. This is not someone who has gotten by on luck. This is someone who has legitimately been pitching in a very impressive manner. And his price is too low because the Red Sox are a good team. And I think that give me the upside that he has shown you all day. He has been good, he has been efficient, and he's been striking people out. While the Red Sox are a tough team to play a pitcher against, uh, it's going to be the same uh, the same MO of, of why you play the Cardinals against DeGrom today, because they look really good and no one else is going to be on them. Adrian Sampson is a good pitcher and he has looked like a fantastic pitcher over the last couple of weeks do not avoid 30 plus point upside simply because the matchup's hard that just makes him a gpp play that doesn't mean he doesn't have the upside it just means you know don't play him in cash play him and be a little more worried than you normally would but he should be legit legitimately right now he should be over 9000 and the fact that he's 7100 is the biggest pricing joke that we have across any of the sites today. So I hate to go out, you know, and 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 ream whatever. Love, love Adrian Sampson. While everyone today is going to be uh, to, to, to stacking me the Flaherty de Grom from the Cardinals Mets game, I really want to go Sampson Price. And I don't know any. Again, while I haven't checked a lot of people today, I don't think anyone else is telling you that. Love both of those guys. Love them. GPP plays, well, not Price. Price is a great play no matter what. He's my favorite pitcher, period. Samson, though, ooh, love Samson today. Don't be shocked if he gets you 25 to 30 DKP, and it looks easy for him. And it looks easy for him. He's it, that's, that's the way he's been pitching. And take note as well, there's only one, one hitter on this Red Sox team over the last week that's hot, and that's J.D. Martinez. All he has to do is avoid him. And he's doing all right. This is this is a good, a good pitcher. Not a fantastic pitcher, but a good pitcher pitching fantastically. And I'm going to keep riding that until his price is 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 accurate for the the skill and the upside that he's shown. Moving on. Samson, what's he on F? Let me check. I have his pricing here. Eight thousand on Fanduel? Oh no, no, absolutely not. No, I wouldn't mind taking him as like the second pitcher. On DraftKings, I really do like him a lot. 8,000 is just a little too much here. Let me switch to FanDuel on this sheet here. I can look at everybody's pricing simultaneously. Uh, Yarbrough, 6,900. I'd rather have Yarbrough uh, for 1,100 discount on there. I'd rather pay up uh, the 1,800 for price. Um, I'd rather go down. This might sound crazy. I'd rather go down 500 to John Gray on FanDuel. Uh, that's a little crazier, but I would play those guys over, over Samson on FanDuel, but that's close. And I really, I do love Samson. So don't, don't make many mistakes, but it's, you, you can't 
deal with the same amount of risk on FanDuel as you can on DraftKings. So when you have a pitcher like a David Price, who I really do think is like a, a, a as sure a thing as you're going to see today, I would rather you know take that 1800 off of batters and lock that surer thing in for FanDuel uh, while still maintaining some risk on DraftKings. If that makes any sense, Eduardo, I hope I'm explaining it right. Uh, I went over Stroman before. Uh, don't like him. He's a, a severe ground ball pitcher, though, so I'm not going to stack against him. I really do like Cisco. I don't mind the Orioles' bats, but I Stroman has looked very bad recently, and on top of that, he doesn't have the strikeout upside that other pitchers uh, in his range are going to have, so there's just no way for me to go there uh, when I could go to other people. Yeah, no problem, Sir Five. Hey, that's what I'm here for. Moving on, next game. We have the Tigers and the Royals. Uh, I've talked about it before. The Royals are really good against lefties, right? But Matt Boyd is a great pitcher. So we're going to have a bit of a, a tussle here in terms of how you want to deal with this. Uh, Boyd is severely under-owned for his upside. Again, as I explained, Flaherty, DeGrom, uh, and Price are taking up a large portion of ownership Uh uh, Osimo has Hap at, oh, excuse me, has Boyd at 14%, which is one, two, three, four, five, the sixth highest projected on pitcher, 3% under Homer Bailey, which should make you throw up in your mouth a little bit if you know anything about baseball. Uh, Matt Boyd is a great pitcher. He has shown you that he has Cy Young type stuff. He is certainly has ace front of the rotation type stuff. And this is a Royals team that while good against lefties, uh, I will not take that matchup over Matt Boyd. You know, there are some lefties that are just better than you, even if you're a good team against lefties and Matt Boyd against the Royals is one of them. If you want to get, you know, I would say if you want to get sneaky, but Boyd isn't owned enough that taking a Royal snack is really that sneaky. It's just taking a worse stack than you could if you understand what I'm saying. So I think that if you're going to pay up, I would rather have price. But if you have that extra 700, there is nothing wrong with going to Boyd. I think Boyd has, you know, a higher upside than price, but I think that he has a lower floor tonight. And I think that if you average like a hundred, uh, you know, a hundred uh, runs of today's games uh, and average them together, that price would outscore Boyd. But that doesn't mean that it's going to happen on all 100. And today might be, you know, try number 82 when Bat Boyd beats David Price by 70 KP. You know, any of that stuff is possible. So Boyd, great pitcher. Royals are tough against lefties, so I put him under price, especially with the price of 10-5. That's always weird when Price is pitching. But I do love Boyd today. So uh, for his ownership and for everything else, absolutely fantastic. On the other side is Homer Bailey. Uh, who is one of the worst pitchers in baseball. I don't know why he is one of the highest owned pitchers of the day, but I would definitely take Tiger's bats in order to combat that. Uh, if we look at who's hot and who isn't lately, uh, we have Jacoby Jones and Kristen Stewart, the one in the two. Both of them are hot lately. Oh, I have it on FanDuel over here. Uh, 4,100 and 3,900 is a little much on DraftKings given some of the other people that you can take. Uh, but 2,700 and 3,000 on FanDuel is fantastic. Um, I will also point out that Harold Castro, uh, batting seventh, is a decent hitter. And he's 2,800 on DraftKings and 2,000 on FanDuel. And he gets a fantastic matchup against Homer Bailey. So uh, I do like a few of the bats on, on Detroit. I really like Jones leading off. Uh, he's found his swing over the last month. Kristen Stewart, who's been hot and gets the lefty matchup. And then Harold Castro, who's going to be ignored at the bottom of that lineup. I also really, really like a lot. The Omaha Stadium. I don't know what that means. What does that mean? You're gonna have to you're gonna have to explain that, Chris. Uh, so yeah, that should cover that. Uh, give me some Tigers bats. Don't like them as much as other places. Give me Matt Boyd if you can afford it. Next up, we've got the Yankees and uh, the White Sox. The Yankees lineup uh, got officialized while I was talking here, and it is almost exactly what I had, except that Gardner and Frazier are flipped seven and eight. 
So we have LeMahieu, Hicks, Voigt, Sanchez, Gregorius, Torres, Gardner, Frazier, and then Mike Talkman, who they just called up for the injured Kendris Morales. Uh, so that is a fine lineup. Ivan Nova is, I, when I talked about them before, uh, I, excuse me, when I talked about pitchers before in general, I talked about how hard it is to stack against a dominant ground ball pitcher. Now, what I mean by that is not that the pitcher is dominant. I mean that the, the ground ball is dominant. So we have Ivan Nova who throws a sinker 41% of the time and a changeup 17% of the time, both of which elicit a ton of ground balls. So with all things being equal, I would rather play a, an equally priced team going against a pitcher that uh, is, is more able or, or gives up more home runs than an Ivan Nova who really never has. He's not someone you can play because he doesn't strike anybody out, even for 4,400 on DraftKings, which is insane. Uh, but if you are playing a Yankee stack, I would expect... I just don't know what the Omaha stadium is or who they are that they're playing in your state. Is that, is that, I'm so confused. Is, is there, is there a game that's not playing in their home in a home stadium today that I did not know about? That's certainly possible. I am very confused. Chris, please explain in more than one sentence what you were talking about. So, uh, Yankees, I do like them as a stack. I think that they are, uh, you know, great hitters. I just think that if you are planning on playing them, expect more uh, doubles and triples and, and that kind of stuff than, you know, a lot of these dudes hitting home runs. Uh, for that reason, if you're going to pay 5000 per player, uh, I would rather just go to, you know, one of the Rockies you know, some of the Rockies bats or some of these other bats that I've been talking about. Because again, when you have someone who gets as many ground balls as Nova does, who lives off of ground ball stuff, it's harder to stack against them. Uh, on the other side, we have J.A. Happ, uh, who's projected to be like the fourth highest owned pitcher today. Uh, I don't like him. But if you are looking at the lineups page, and I suggest you do take a look at the lineups page because that is free all the time. And I am clickety clacking it onto your screens in the YouTube chat right now. Uh, the lineups page, uh, and then go take a look at the Yankees and White Sox. Uh, if you see like a pinkish purple there, that means the batter is cold. And if you see bright green, that means the batter is hot. Right? The Royals Tigers are playing in Omaha, not in Detroit. I am. I'm going to have to look that up, Chris. That is news to me. I am definitely going to have to look that up because I did not know that at all. All right, yeah. We're playing in Omaha Stadium for the Royals game Thursday. Series finale. I do not want to. Oh, I don't want to turn ad blocking off, you son of a bitch. You son of a bitch. All right. So I don't have any park information on them. Uh, that is something I'm going to have to dig into. So thank you for letting me know that. I, I, I had not seen that anywhere, Chris. Thank you so much. I hate that. I don't want to turn ad blockers on to read like an article. Come on, man. Give me a break. And I'm a journalist for Christ's sake. Uh, I'm going to have to look that up and I'll post them on Twitter. So I think that covers everything with the Yankees and the White Sox. Oh, no, I didn't even talk about the White Sox bats. Look at the lineup page. Everybody's pink. It's terrible. Lori Garcia, Abreu, Alonso, Rondon, Sanchez, and Cordell. That's one, two, three, four, five, six of the nine batters on this team have been cold lately. Green is hot and purple is cold. That is correct, Cody. So Garcia, Abreu, Alonzo, Rondon, Sanchez, and Cordell. That means they've all been hitting with like an OPS about 500 and under and a WOBA of about 200 and under over the last week. All of them are cold. So while I don't love Hap, oh boy, do I love the spot that he's in against a flailing White Sox team. Um, I've said it before and I'll say it again. Hap is at that age when he's he's not he didn't fall off the cliff, but he's slowly making his way down. 
Uh, he's going to have some starts where he looks like he's a kid, and he's going to have a lot more starts where he looks like the 38-year-old dude that he is. Uh, you know, he's not quite Crypt Keeper yet, but he's getting there. Uh, so while it's never safe, he's always one of those GPP type plays. Uh, Hap, man, those those White Sox have looked terrible lately. And the important thing and the last thing to note is that the only hot hitter, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. If it's a college stadium, it should be smaller. But I have to, I do have to look that up. I really do have to look that up. That's really crazy. I I did not even realize that. Uh, I have to check the dimensions and and everything. Um, yeah, I have to. I have to. I assume that everything is is the, the dimensions are the same as they would be uh, if they were in Kansas City, you know. And they 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 redid the park because I saw something about the grounds crew doing a lot of work, remaking the park to to be around the same. But definitely going to check that out, especially if they get to use metal bats. Oh, big bonus. Uh, anyway, all joking aside, J. A. Happ. I would rather play him than the White Sox today. I don't love him. Don't love the ownership, but oh boy, the White Sox have looked terrible. All right, let's move on. We got two games left. Uh, we only have one confirmed lineup out of these two games. So most of this stuff is going to be uh, me making things up, you know, on terms of what I think the projected lineups are going to be, but I think that's more than fine. Uh, we have Matthew Strom coming back from the IL, taking on John Gray. John Gray doesn't show splits uh, homer away, so he pitches in Coors Field the same way he pitches out of Coors Field. He is in the Masahiro Tanaka camp of pitchers that I've talked about many times. He is someone that uh, we can never really count on, right? He is like a potentially perennial GPP play. Uh, whether or not he does well in any game, in any park against any team depends on how he feels that day. If his stuff is there, the Padres are going to get completely shut down. And you have John Gray at 8,300 who's going to get 30 DKP and no one's going to be on him because he's a pitcher in Coors Field. But he has every chance of giving up 13 runs to the Padres in two innings and getting pulled. Uh, that is the GPP nature of John Gray. And without knowing, you know, without having an interview with him, or seeing how he's pitching, because he could just lie in the interview, we don't really know how John Gray is going to come out. For that reason, uh, when, you know, I like to look in that in that situation at, at ownership and potential and ceiling and all that. So we have John Gray, who's going to be completely ignored today, going against a Padres team that's only projected to get about five runs, which sounds not that much, but for Coors Field, that's a significant drop-off. Uh, they have not been hitting that well recently. Uh, if you, again, if you look at the lineups page, you have Tatis who's been hitting well, but Reyes, Machado, Myers, and Austin Hedges have all been hitting really bad. I know Hedges is only 2,900, so it's worth the chance, but this is not a team that has been doing well lately. They're not coming in here on good form. And Gray, again, he can get you that 30 DKP anywhere. He just has to feel it that day. And if he comes out tonight, and this is one of those days where he's gripping the ball right, you're going to be sad that you didn't play him. So while it's not, you know, a cash play, while it's not something you should be, uh, you know, going over the moon to play, you know, I would rather pay up for price. I would rather uh, pay down for Samson. John Gray should be in your pool today and you should give him some serious consideration, serious consideration. Uh, on the other side, Matthew Strom, sometimes it's really easy. A lefty coming off the IL, going into Coors Field, who Good luck, kid. You're going to give up like 20 runs. Uh, give me all of the Rockies bats. Uh, they are they are all things excluded. My favorite stack of the day in that I think that they're going to put up more runs than anybody. They have the best matchup in the best place uh, than everybody. So I think that the ownership is going to make you want to pivot off of them. I think that, uh, you know, trying to get some other pitchers may have you pivot off of them. Ooh, excuse me. But, you know, Story, Arenado, Murphy, Desmond, way too cheap at 4400 Blackman does not really show any problems hitting lefties in Coors Field. Uh, if you check his splits at home and away, um, this is a great, great lineup. And with everyone trying to get DeGrom and with Price also being so highly owned, I think this might be a spot where you can pay up to be contrarian. Uh, and I think I'm going to try to do that. 
You know, I do like Samson a lot. And while I do want to get price, I think that it's certainly possible to get, you know, a couple of these really good pitchers and still get some Colorado bats while fitting in, you know, some other dudes in and around like, a, you know, a Darno or, a, you know, punting down some other positions. So that is a very easy one. A lefty going into course field is no thank you every time. Uh, and then the last game is the Cubs and the Dodgers. Uh, there is one batter here that I would consider my play of the day if he is in the lineup, and that is Max Muncy. Um, I've talked in great detail about how reverse splits are like the holy grail. So what you want, what you really want, uh, you want to zig a zig ah. What you really, really want is to find batters with extreme reverse splits going against same-handed pitchers with extreme reverse splits. Oh, and the Cubs lineup just popped. Perfect timing. Here we have John Lester, a lefty with extreme reverse splits, going against Max Muncy, a lefty with extreme reverse splits. Jackpot. If he bats second, I'm going to take Muncy as a one-off today, which means he will most certainly be my first baseman because I really want to get Arenado in at third. Uh, it is very, very rare that you get two extreme reverse splits people going against one another, and when that happens, oh boy, I love it. It is more chance for them to go off than in any other situation. And on top of that, Muncy is hot lately, and people are going to ignore him because they assume lefty on lefty means it's a stay away, but it isn't. <clears throat> oh, boy. So while I may not be, uh, excuse me, the biggest fan of the uh, Dodgers stack as a whole, again, uh, they play a lot of righties, and Lester is much, much better against righties than lefties. Max Muncy is going to be my favorite runoff of the day, assuming he plays and bats second. You know, even if he bats fifth or sixth, I don't really care. If Max Muncy's in the, if Max Muncy is in that lineup, he is my favorite play. Uh, on the other side, Clayton Kershaw has looked good recently. Um, if we take a look at the Cubs lineup, Schwarber, Bryant, Rizzo, Baez, Contreras, Almora, Russell, pitcher, Bote. Uh, so they're again going with the pitcher batting eighth. I thought that was just a function of them being in Coors Field but it looks like they are moving back to that, unfortunately. Uh, unfortunately for people who don't like stupid things that are stupid. Um, okay, so that is better for Kershaw as a whole. Uh, yeah, oops, that's the wrong spot. Let's try that one more time. Sorry, folks, I'm trying to get the lineup page updated for y'all so you can see everything while it happens, while you're on the page. Uh, so, yeah, Kershaw... Uh, 10-1 doesn't strike out as many people as I would like. Cubs don't strike out as much as I would like. His ownership is going to be higher than you would like. So I'd rather have Price or go up to Boyd. But I don't think anyone's going to tell you Kershaw's a bad play. Uh, I would just much rather have other similarly priced people uh, than Clayton Kershaw tonight, given the way he's pitched. Uh, and that is without the strikeout upside that he had previously had. You know, Kershaw is someone who would get you 11, 12 strikeouts per nine. Uh, if you've been looking at his stats, it is, you know, the last couple of weeks, it's 6.4. So it's not, it's not really someone that uh, with the people around him getting, you know, price at 12 strikeouts per nine, DeGrom, who I don't really love, 12 strikeouts per nine, John Gray, 11 strikeouts per nine, Matt Boyd, 13 strikeouts per nine. There's just no way to pay over 10,000 for 6.5 strikeouts per nine uh, for a team that already doesn't strike out that much. So that is everything for baseball. Uh, so any, if anybody has any other questions, I am done. Otherwise I am going to go put my leg up because my God, it hurts to do this. Uh, oh, one thing I wanted to say basketball wise, uh, my favorite captain for tonight uh, is clay. And I don't think it's even close. So uh, if, in terms of the pricing and in terms of everything they're going to have to do, uh, I am starting tonight 
with Clay as my captain and building around there. Uh, if you can fit in Kawhi and either Curry or Dre, uh, more power to you. I would love to be able to do that. Otherwise, I really do like Ibaka. Uh, I really do like Ibaka. I like taking a chance that Iguodala is going to really have to do a lot more again today with Durant out the whole game, and he's going to be underpriced and undervalued uh, because – you know, he didn't have to do as much last game until Durant got injured. And that does offset his statistics a little bit. So that's basically everything. Uh, Eduardo, I would never, ever do that with a bat. Never, ever. Uh, I would be over the field on Max Muncy here. Let me check something for you. Because this is, this is, this is important. Let's go first base, third base. Max Muncy is projected at 5% ownership, right? This is this is a point for debate, and I'm totally fine with that. But, you know, I think that you want to try to get as many variants as you can. Uh, so I would play between 25 and 30 Max Muncy lineups at most, right? Uh, having 25 to 30% exposure to him when everyone else is at 5% exposure, only 5% of lineups are going to have him. That's where I would draw my upper limit because, it, you know, while I love him and while I, I really do love the spot and while, if, you know, I'm going to probably play one lineup and I'm going to have him in 100% of that lineup. So, I mean, I'm, I'm going to literally have him in 100% of my lineups because I'm only playing one probably today. Uh, but, if you're playing 150, your goal should be to win, right? Which means trying to get things, trying to get as many variations of the theme as you can, you know, and that means spreading exposure out across a lot of different options. Uh, teams to eliminate from the player pool, and this will be the last thing before I go. Uh, in terms of hitting, uh, I, hmm, if you're playing 150, 150 teams to eliminate from the player pool. No. Honestly, no. Uh, I would, what I would say is, keep your exposure to the Texas Rangers low. Like I would only have a couple five lineups or so with Rangers bats in them. Um, I like them so far less than I like any other team today that if there were one team, if you were to eliminate one team, it would be the Rangers. I just don't think that's a smart play given Price's ownership. I think that it would still be smart to maintain some additional leverage over him just in case this is one of those crazy days he blows up. And as you've seen in baseball, anything can happen any given day. So while it may not pay off, while the odds are it will not pay off on you know whatever lineups, uh, I think that having some exposure – you know, there's no like super ace today going. It's not like Scherzer going against the Marlins today where it's like, no, I can just stay away from there. Uh, thank you, Eduardo. Unfortunately, it's a permanent disability. But, you know, hey, I, I never stop. I'm going to keep keep fighting, keep hustling, keep doing what I do every day. That's what I'm here for. So thank you all very much. I love you all. I really do mean it. I really do. Uh, I really do love you all. Thank you. It means the world to me. Uh, have a beautiful day and uh, best of luck tonight. Thank you all again.